Bruchem Aboim. Thank you very much for coming. This uh, evening's lecture will be dealing with uh, the Omer. Um, the question becomes, why do we count 49 days of the Omer? So our rabbis tell us that at the time of the exodus from Egypt, when our ancestors left, they were on the 49th level of impurity. And had they fallen to the 50th level, they would have entered into what we call the spiritual abyss, a black hole, and God Almighty would not have been able to redeem them. And so on the day of Pesach, God, with his ultimate mercy, took the whole Jewish nation from the 49th level of impurity and elevated them to the 49th level of purity. However, this was a total gift, not something that they had earned. This can kind of be compared to someone who was taken up a mountain by helicopter. And he's able to see and enjoy the magnificence of the mountain. And he's then told that if he really wants to appreciate the mountain's true beauty, he'll have to climb it himself. And the climb, which only took minutes in a helicopter, would now take 49 days to complete. The helicopter ride had shown him which path he was to have to take to be able to successfully scale the mountain and reach its peak. So too, God Almighty took us out of Egypt, and on that day he elevated us to the 49th level of purity. Then on the second day of Pesach, he told us we would now have to retrace our steps up that spiritual mountain so that on the 50th day we would be worthy of receiving the Torah on Mount Sinai. Now, it's an interesting aside. We count 49 days. But if you stop and think, where the Jews were on the 49th level of impurity and had to reach the 49th level of purity in order to be able to receive the Torah on, on Mount Sinai. So we really should have counted 98 days. 49 impure, 49 pure. So why is it that we only count 49 days of the Omer? The example you can, I can give is much like if you go to a yard sale and you purchase a, a candelabra, it's all black, and you pay a minimal amount of money for it. And you get home and you take the dross, the blackness off that candelabra, and all of a sudden you realize it's silver and it shines. What did you do? All you did was remove the dross, the blackness, and then the silver automatically sh shines. And so to a Jew. A Jew at his very core is a Dover Shabikadusha, a holy object. Since man has within him, a Jew has within him that divine shechina, that, that spark of divinity of God. So you don't have to add anything. In fact, even tshuva, when the secular world talks about repenting, they talk about turning over a new leaf. Tshuva, for us, we say toshuv hey, return back to God, go back to your source. You don't have to become something new, be who you are. And this is the idea. That's why we only count 49 days to remove the negativity. And then the spiritual high will automatically come. Now, this co counting is unusual. It's not done by the Jewish courts or any national body of the nation of Israel. It is done by each and every Jew on an individual basis. Those who avail themselves of the opportunity to elevate their midot, their character traits, during this period of time, will reap great spiritual benefits. However, those who allow these days to pass without giving any thought to what these days represent will not be able to truly appreciate what spiritual connection there is between Pesach and Shavuot. Now, the sphere of period begins with the Omer offering, which consisted of barley. Barley was considered to be animal fodder, animal food. And this alludes to the fact that at the time of the exodus from Egypt, our ancestors were on the spiritual level of animals. The next 50 days are then used to elevate ourselves to the level of man, so that on Shavuot, we may, we may partake of what we call the Shnei Lechem, the two loaves, which were made of wheat, human food. So the goal of the Sphira period is for us to elevate ourselves from the level of animal and to attempt to reach the level of human. It's interesting. There are Yochan and Ben-Nuri at the end of chapter 2 of Edios in the Mishnah that uses that to, says that the term of punishment for the wicked in Gehenna is from Pesach through Shavuot. Since beginning with the time of the exodus from Egypt, 
This period has been designated as a time for removing the stains from our souls and purifying them from their contamination, whether in this world or the next. Now, the Torah commands us to count not only days, but also weeks. As it says, you shall count for yourself Sheba Shabbosos, seven weeks, seven Shabbosim. The Torah refers to these weeks as Shabboses, Shabbosim, to teach us that Shabbos is the primary day of the week. And from it, all the other days receive their sustenance. As we know, the number seven alludes to the seven days of creation. Each day of the Sphira, one has the ability to recreate his own personal world. And in some way, in some way help to bring the world, in general, closer to the state of purity that God Almighty so desires for this world. Now the Zohar says that God wanted to marry Klal Yisrael, the nation of Israel, but they were in a state of nida, spiritual impurity, like a menstrual woman. They needed to purify themselves for seven weeks. Now the reason why they needed seven weeks instead of the menstrual cycle of seven days was because the extraordinary amount of impurity that they'd accumulated during their years in Egypt. Now these seven weeks also correspond to what we call the seven ushbizin, the seven guests that we welcome into our sukkah each day on Sukkot. As Eliyahu Kitov says in the book of our heritage, every week is an allusion to one of these personalities. The first week alludes to Abram Ravino, Abraham our father, who personifies the attribute of gemilas chasadim, loving kindness. Through his selfless love and devotion to all people, the whole world was brought closer to God Almighty. Second week alludes to Yitzchak Avinu, Isaac our father, who personifies the attribute of strength, gvura, of character. Through him the whole world learned pachat, the fear the awe of God Almighty. The third week alludes to Yaakov Avinu, Jacob our father, who personifies the attribute of Tiveret, beauty. As the Torah says, Yaakov was an Ishtam, a perfect man, blending together the kindness of his grandfather and the severity of his father. The fourth week alludes to Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses our teacher, who personifies the attribute of eternity, Netzach, which is Torah, Moshe, our teacher, gave his life for the Torah and was thereby able to ensure its eternity and the eternity of the nation of Israel for all generations. The fifth week alludes to Aaron HaKohen, Aaron the high priest, who personifies the attribute of hod, splendor, and he brought humility, gratitude, and peace into the world. As it says in Pirkei Avot, he was an Oev Shalom and a Rodev Shalom. He was a lover of peace and a pursuer of peace. He loved all of mankind and brought them nearer to the Torah. The sixth week alludes to Yosef HaTzadik, to Joseph, the righteous one, who personifies the virtue which lies at the foundation of all morality. Yosef's righteousness was the foundation of our existence in the exile. He was the first Jew to live and bring his children up in a totally immoral society. Yet he was able to instill within them true Torah values. In fact, they were able to reach the level of becoming two of the actual tribes of the nation of Israel, Ephraim and Menasheh. The seventh week alludes to Dabin Amela, King David, who personifies the attribute of Malchut, of kingship. And just as he had no years of his own, and he had to have them given to him from Adam, first man. So too his whole life was one of humility, self-sacrifice, and tshuva, repentance. He taught the world to sing songs of praise to the king of the world. Again, the Psalms of Tehillim. Each of these seven midot, character traits, are closely interwined and all are interdependent. None exist in isolation. Kindness, without strength of character, becomes soft-heartedness. Glory, without kindness, leads to sin. None of these qualities is complete unless kindness, chesed, is part of their makeup. 
Now, one might think, why bother with the Sphira now? After all, most of the counting is already finished. The Marsha in Moed Katan states that Lagvom remarks the beginning of the final third stage of the days of the Omer. The emergence of a Jewish nation can be compared to the three stages of birth of a child. The embryo developing in the womb, the actual birth, and then the growth of the child. And so too, the history of the world is divided into three stages. The first 2,000 years before the giving of the Torah, which is called the years of Tohu. The second 2,000 years after the giving of the Torah, which again is called the time of Torah. And the third 2,000 years are called the coming of Mashiach, may he come quickly in our time, of which the last third is the most important. So what we see is it's never too late. In fact, this we learn out from Rabbi Akiva, whose 24,000 students died during the period of the Sphira. What did Rabbi Akiva do after this tragedy? Did he give up? And the answer is no. He started all over again. This time, not with 24,000 students, only five. But these five students became the lights of the world. Among them was Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai. Now, the Chassam Sofer brings up an interesting point. When a person brings a toe to sacrifice, a sacrifice that was brought if someone was saved by a miracle from God, from God Almighty, he would bring, along with the animal sacrifice, a mincha offering, a meal offering, which consisted of fine flour and oil. Altogether, he would bring 40 loaves, 30 loaves, which were matzah, and 10 loaves, which were chametz, leavened. The ten loaves of chametz weighed as much as the thirty loaves of matzah. The chametz alludes to one's body and the matzah to one's soul. Normally, when one would bring a toda sacrifice, he would bring all forty loaves at the same time. However, when Klai Yisrael, when the nation of Israel left Egypt, they were not on a high enough level to bring them both together. And so on Pesach, when they freed all the spiritual sparks in Egypt. They partook of the spiritual part of the Todah sacrifice, symbolized by the matzah. Then on Shavuot, when they reached the level of sanctification of the body, Kedushat HaGuf, then they brought the Shnei Lechem, the two loaves of chametz, which represented the more material aspects of the body. So this raises a question. Why then do we all eat on Pesach a matzah, and only the priest eat the shnei halechem, the two uh, leavened breads on Shavuot. And the answer is that every Jew, every Jew, has within himself a lofty soul, and can therefore partake of the matzah. However, at Har Sinai, at Mount Sinai, even though the whole nation was able to reach the level of kedushat haguf, the sanctification of the body, was only temporary. It wasn't realistic to believe that it was a state that they could maintain. Only those tzaddikim gemurim, those complete righteous individuals symbolized by the priests, would be able to retain that level of sanctity. And therefore, it was only they, the priests, who partook of the two loaves of chametz on Shavuot. Story told of Reb Nassim Nata Shapiro, the Rav of Krakow, who lived in the early part of the 17th century. He held the most prestigious position in the Jewish world at that time due to the city's prominence as the bastion of Torah life and scholarship. However, Rav Nussin felt incomplete since the demands of community life left him little time to follow his true desire, which was learning Torah. So when the smaller city of Bechuk offered him a position as their rabbi, he eagerly accepted their offer since he felt being the rabbi of a smaller community would allow him more time to study Torah. As you can imagine, the people of Krakow were devastated when they heard that their beloved and saintly rabbi was leaving. They tried everything that they could do to convince him to stay, but nothing they could say or do seemed to be able to change his mind. And on the day that came for him to leave, people by Chuk sent a wagon and representatives 
to bring the illustrious Reb Nassim Adler to their city. And they began loading up his belongings, his furniture, into the wagon. And someone came to him from the Bet Din, from the Jewish court in the city. And they said to him, Rabbi, we have two litigants that are at the court, and they need a, court, a case to be judged. He said, I'm leaving. They said, but there's no one available. Could you please, as a last thing, listen to this one case. So while they were loading the wagon, he said, okay. And he went to the court. And there were two litigants in front of him. One he could see was a somewhat wealthy businessman. And the other looked like a Torah scholar. And the Torah scholar, pardon me, the rich man stood up first. And he told his case to Reb Nassim. He said that he had been on a business trip <clears throat> and had come back. And uh, when he got off the train, being Jewish, he was hungry. And he was wondering if maybe there was something, something he could buy, something that was kosher for him to eat in the train station that he could nash on before he got home and had dinner. And he looked, and sure enough, he found a bagel vendor a man selling bagels. And so he said, I went up to the man who was selling the bagels. And um, when he sold me the bagel, I kind of mumbled and he heard me. Do I make a hamotzi on bread or is it a mazonot on cake? Is it big enough? And I wasn't really sure what the bracha, what the blessing should be. And I was kind of thinking out loud. <laughs> and this uh, bagel vendor starts quoting Gemaras and Shulchan Aruchs for me and tells me this person says this and that. He goes through a whole discussion, a rabbinical discussion on the question. And I look at him and I say, you're not a bagel vendor. You're a Talmud Chacham. You're, you're a scholar. Why are you selling bagels? He looked at me and smiled and he said, ain't kemel ain't Torah. If you don't have flour, you don't have Torah. I need to eat. So I sell bagels. So, being a businessman, I decided to strike up, a, strike up a deal with him. And I said to him, I have a son at home that needs a malamed. He needs a teacher. And you're very well qualified to do so. How about we make a deal where you will teach my son in the morning, and then you can learn by yourself in the afternoon, and I'll pay you for the whole day, and this way, I'll benefit, you'll benefit, and you don't have to be here selling bagels. And the rich man said that we made a deal. And it went on that my son loved him greatly and began to learn very well. And the whole situation was wonderful. My son was gaining. It seemed as if his Muhammad was gaining. But meanwhile, I was I'm taken on a trip where I had to be gone for a few weeks. And I went to my son's Malamed and I paid him for three weeks in advance. <clears throat> and when I came back from my trip, again, I'm hungry again. And I want to maybe that my, the Malamed sold his business to someone else. So I went looking to see if I could get another bagel. I knew what the bracha was this time, though. And to my surprise, who's selling bagels? My son's Malamed, the teacher. And I say to him, what are you doing here? You're supposed to be teaching my son. You're supposed to be learning. And after that, I brought him here because I want to know what's going on. And he sits down. Rabbi turns to the Malamed. The Malamed stands up. And he says, Dear Rabbi, everything that this rich man has told you is 100% true. He hired me to teach his son. His son is a wonderful young man. Everything was terrific. And as he said, he was going on this trip and he gave me the money for three weeks. And I went home. And I took the wages for the three weeks and I gave it to my Aisha Schail. And I said, Khanala, here's the money. And I expected to see her smile greatly with the money that I gave her. Instead, she seemed very concerned. And she said, Moshe, we've lost God. And I said to her, what do you mean, lost God? She said, we've lost God. And I said to her, How do you, what do you mean we lost God? How can we lose God? 
And she said to me, very simple. She said, before you got the job being this Malamed, you would go every morning out to the train station to sell bagels. And I would say, so new, Moisha, you think we'll have money to feed the kids? And you say, God will help. And that would go on, and then on Friday, Thursday, before Shabbos, I would say, so new, Moisha, will there be money to buy what we need for the Shabbat? And again, you would look up to heaven and you would say, God will provide. And this went on day after day, week after week. Since you had this job, not once, not once have you said anything about God. We've lost God. And I thought, and I said she was right. And that's why I came back to selling bagels in the train station. Rav Nussan looked at the two litigants and he said, if there are people like this in Krakow, how can I leave? And this is the idea that a person needs to work on himself, to come closer to God, to work on his character traits, to understand what is Iker and what is tough, what is important and what is not. But in the end, if you don't have God as part of the equation, what you have is a vessel that's empty, or at least a hole in it, it will be empty soon. May God Almighty bless us that with our counting of the Omer this year, that we have earned the merit to herald in the coming of Mashiach quickly, and may it be this year. Thank you, God bless, and Shabbat Shalom, and Gudyanta Feshvuz.